Hey guys, it's me, Rebecca. So this will be the start of another weekly vlog. It is currently Sunday and it's quite gloomy right now. Like we've had some sun come out, but it's just been very dark, very like cloudy, just gloomy. Like they they did promise rain today and it hasn't fallen yet, so, yet, so that's good, I guess, because. I did go outside to rake some leaves just to clean up my backyard a bit and I've also done some cleaning and yeah, and I have done some reading. I started a new book, I started Sunbringer by Hannah Kenner, which is the sequel to God Killer. I'm just gonna talk about these, about God Killer since, well, this is a sequel. But God Killer is about this woman named Kaysen, who is a God Killer. Like, that's pretty straightforward, her job, she kills gods. And we start that book by saying that she and her family, they were offered as sacrifices to her, a god, and her father was able to get to allow her to escape, and many years later, she hunts gods, kills them until she comes across a god she cannot kill because it's attached to a girl, like a young girl, like I think the girl's like 11 or so, like extremely young. And if she kills the god, she kills the girl. And she and this girl named Inara, and the god, it's like a minor god named Skitty, I believe it, that's how you pronounce it, who's the god of white lies, or dry lies. They go on an adventure to this place where there's the opportunity to separate a girl and a god from one another. And along the way, they join forces, I guess, with a man named Elo, who was a former knight to the king of this land, and he's now a baker, but the king is a very good friend of his, so he's doing him a favor, and we learn exactly why why the king sent Elo on this journey. So, and with the second book, we sort of, I guess, pretty m almost immediately, but maybe a few days after the events of the first book, and we see how the like Elo and Ara and Skitty they are dealing with events that happen at the end of the first book, and yeah, I don't know how people to say because I don't want to spoil that ending. But essentially, they were separated from, and they travel to Kissing's like sister's house to get more answers. And uh, because of like all of the events in the first book, and she wants to become a shoulder to help out to get her revenge on the king who might be responsible for the events in the first book, uh, leading up to like why she and Skitty ended up with Kissing. And, and we see how the king, we get new POV, we get the POV of Aaron, it's like A-R-R-E-N, who is the king of this land. How he's being affected by something. <laughs> how he is like kind of playing this chess game with other lands, other uh, countries in this land to try and get more resources from them to win their gods and you know, we get more, I guess, politics in here which I am intrigued about because I don't... I think that was kind of lacking in the, in the first book, I don't remember entirely, but yeah, so far I'm intrigued and you see how he's in she learns that a god she fought, she killed, or a god she did kill in the first book like she sees how the worships or worshippers of that god still worship like they do they don't kill the children but they offer the children in sacrifices like they burn them I think. You know, there wasn't any death in depth in that scene. But how these people will still worship this god and if they worship her enough they, she will be reborn and it seems like th this god like it was a god that Aaron was working with that was deceiving him because he thought, oh, she wants to be an ally with me. No, she wanted to dominate him. So, yeah, there is that. And, yeah, 
I think that's all I can really say for now without spoiling the first book too much. But so far, I do have to say I do feel the characters' emotions and um, mo the motivations behind their actions and how they're feeling about everything about what's happened and the anger and the de determination they feel. So yeah, so far I am intrigued. I would say. Even if I'm only, I do not say I'm only 56 pages in, so, yeah. So, it's the next day, and I've just done some more cleaning and whatnot. I did go for a bit of a walk before it got cloudy, so it was quite nice. And I have done some more reading of Sunbringer, and now I'm on page 148. And so far, I'm probably going to See, and also I do. I just worry about like um not expressing everything I want to express. So, yeah, but we see how Kason she has the choice to go back to her family, to go to Inara and Ello, to assure them like she's alive, or to hunt down the god she was supposed to kill in the last book and stop this god from being reborn because with the people with their prayers, their shrines, their sacrifices, it's gonna allow this god to be reborn, to come back and she wants to end this once and for all. And you see how she decides to do what she does and kill this god. And we see as well, like she sees along the way, really, that along the, the blind fate these people hold in this god, like how they don't question the gods, how they just do what they think the god wants, like with the sacrifices and the shrines and everything. Like, they think that the gods are good, and that's like, I guess, a, a, a theme that's been covered in this book in more than one way. Because we also see how the people like who they worship Aaron, they, they worship the king, they think that what he's doing is good. Like they don't question what he's doing whatsoever. Like they have blind faith in him and for him to know what is good for them and good for the people when and like with the gods there are people who are trying to stop him, to stop what he wants to do, which is go through the cities and march through the cities, and he's having these cities like put aside food for his army, food that to feed the people of the cities that live there. And Aaron, he wants to annihilate those he sees as a threat, those he sees a threat to his crown, like Anara's mother, and the like, uh, uh, I guess, what is he like? the kind of leader or something of the town that Ello and Nora are in because he sided with he at one point he did side with Nora's mother and what she wanted to do, do and even if he no longer aligns with that Aaron sees that still at one point like his trust was betrayed. So I guess like the things I don't know, those with higher power and like, blind free people will hold because we also see that when Nora goes with, I think it's Tally to the Ar archives like forum, and we see how some of the archives they have this blind faith in a king, and they will go against Tally and Nora for Nora's actions. Nora, she did go into uh, the section of the archives where information about the gods are stored to try and find information about herself, about her history, about who her father could be and that stuff. So someone often cause someone to think like um Tally is a traitor and have the guards like come in even through the guards are not so the king's guards are not allowed into the archives or the um, like uh, uh oh my the con uh, I guess the plaza that the uh, archives hold their meet archives like hold their meetings. And something else I find interesting in this novel is 
I guess there are different methods people want to go about doing things because Elo, he, uh, he was a guard of the king at one point and he was involved in war and so for him he sees violence as like one of, probably the only way really, to end what Eren is doing once and for all and he meets the, um, this person named Nala, I think that's what you say your name, who she once but information she's creating these pamphlets to these but information to the people who, like to teach them to teach them like what she what is why what is actually why and um, I guess give them the facts and not like any propaganda that might be spread. And so she thinks that the way to fight it is with just teaching people like give them the knowledge that they should have on page 111 she tells Ella a story of when her grandparents discovered that the local people were being exploited to mine the stone in. They didn't know, but when they did find out, they brought weapons to help them fight back. And on the end of page 111, she says, she sighed. Retribution on both sides was bloody and cruel. Many innocents were killed. She cast her eyes at Elo. If we commit to violence, when will it stop? And Elo replies on page 112. If we do not, countered Elo, will anything change? And for him, he can only see violence as the only method of ending things. Like, if we don't resort to violence, like, how else can we change anything? No one believes that given people the knowledge that would be useful, say, but I don't know, like, I guess both sides are right, I mean, like, yes, teaching and learning can help and maybe violence, but both are also wrong because people, they, they can learn this information, they can take it, but they can remain, they can remain ignorant about it, they can think, oh, it's, no, it's BS, or they're so set in the ways that any information that might be objectively correct, my, they might not like, take it in or they might just ignore because it doesn't align with their beliefs. Which is, and my violence, like, maybe it can help, but it's like, I, I, I would say it's more of a temporary solution than a permanent one. And as well, like, many people are killed for, for violent acts and or wars that have nothing to do with them, like many incidents are caught in a crossfire in so many wars, so... I don't know, both sides are right, both sides are wrong, it's... I don't know, this, I guess the method depends on the person, so... Yeah, I am very much enjoying the things we see in this book, and... Yeah, I'm also curious as well, like... Nara, because... She wants help like she just feels like she's stuck she feels useless but she is also going through immense grief like her mother was killed for something she believed in and so she doesn't know anything about her past like she doesn't know anything about her father or why skitty is it i guess attached to her and she wants answers to an immense amount of questions so I am curious in if in this book she gets more answers if those will unravel for her. Yeah, so far I am enjoying this book more than the first book I would say. That the first book I felt like was more of like a a journey story, while this one we do center in the politics of this world, which is something I just find very intriguing. Like I do like a good journey from time to time, but I just found with the first book, it was just another journey book while well, this one, but we're, deep, we're getting deeper into the world itself with this one, so yeah, I think so far I'm enjoying this one so far, so yeah, and I think that's all for now. So, it's the next day, and as you saw, I did go to a library book store, it was one I've taken you to before, it's like a buy bag for five dollars and fill it up with as, much, as many books as you want. I did go with my mother, who I guess went a bit overboard, let's say. 
But uh, today I only got three. I got The Only Good Indians by Stephen Graham Jones. Which is about uh, four American Indian men after a disturbing event from their youth puts to put them in a desperate struggle for their lives. Tracked by an entity bent on retribution, these childhood friends are hopeless as the culture and traditions they left behind catch up to them in a violent, vengeful way. I think that I'm not sure how I if I can show you this cover um, in the miso soup by Why Merrick Homme and this was translated by Ralph McCarthy. Mm, yeah, that's all. I don't know, it's it's quite a, a guest graphic cover and I just don't want this video taken off YouTube for that so long. But um this is this takes place just before New Year's and Frank, a overweight American tourist, has hired Kanji to take him on a guided tour of Tokyo's sleazy nightlife. But Frank's behavior is so strange that Kanji begins to entertain a horrible suspicion. That his new client is in fact the serial killer currently terrorizing the city. It is not until later, however, that Kanji learns exactly how much he has to fear and how irreparably his encounter with this great white well of an American will change. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, I'm very much intrigued about that. And last but certainly not least is Womb by Emma Don Donahue. I now own. Or I'm not done any books. I did read, I think it's The Wonder. And yeah, I didn't need to read more. And this is about this boy named Jack who's five years old. And to him, Wilmin's the only thing he's ever the only world he's ever known. It's where he was born, it's where he and his mom eat and sleep and play and learn. And I ma uh, shot him safely in the wardrobe where Jack is meant to be asleep when old and Lincoln visits. And one day he and Ma are able to escape womb and yeah. <laughs> so I'm very much intrigued about that. And it's been quite chilly today, like this book so started around twelve o'clock and before it was quite windy, quite chilly, and afterwards it was quite warm but yeah, I wasn't really able to go and watch on the walk with this because my mother did have an appointment, so... But as well, today I did do some reading of Sunbringer. And now I'm on page 202, and again, I'm still liking it quite a lot. But we do see a question of who, f who, can f who should fight in a war if children should be kept out of war or if they should be involved in the kiss and she is with this water god named An A-A-N and An is like children should be involved in war and they're not innocent beings kiss and he they, they should be innocent like, that they should be kept away from war and we also see this with Elo and Inara and Inara she wants to fight she wants to to be in, involved in Elo, he wants to keep her out of this. He wants to protect her, he wants to keep her safe, like he wants to be her armor when really that's not what she wants. And we really see how frightened even the gods are of what's to come because on she is afraid of Heth. I don't know how to pronounce that. It's H S E T H I. Because even Vu has is currently dead, she will come back to life. Like even if he destroys all of her shrines, he still has followers, and with them breathing, they are bringing her back to life. Like to them, his who is the fire, fire god, she brought them warmth and comfort on cold and dark winter nights. So they worship the ground she walks on. And, the, and destroying their shrines, the, destroying her shrines, this won't stop the people from believing in her. So. Um, advises Kissin to try and save King Aaron and use him to fight against um, his fight fire fire. And as well, 
It's where we see really how it all runs during the things like she um we see how she wants to fight but prevent it too like like I mentioned. Ella is keeping her out of any warm talks or anything like that. And she thinks everyone is against her because of what she did, because she's not into the archives and caused Kelly to get in an immense amount of trouble and all that. But it doesn't seem like they want her to leave or they will abandon her. Like it seems like they want to keep her safe, they want to help her. So Nora I think this has semblance and abandonment issues because Kitty, the god she's attached to, has tried to leave her in the past and she thinks her mother and Kaysen have abandoned her with their deaths. Kaysen is alive, but her mother she knows for certain is dead. And yeah, she's just afraid like she doesn't know who she is and I guess that also threatens her immensely and she you know. Yeah. And other than that I I do like seeing how people from I guess different walks of life, like there are soldiers involved, there are anchors, like the everyday person coming together for a common cause. Like they all want to fight King R and they want to stop him so they're coming together. Like these are people who like day to day they wouldn't be associated with one another but because they all have I guess this common cause they are coming together, so yeah, so far I'm very much intrigued about this and intrigued just to really see like how it all plays out because honestly it's kind of weird. You have kids and who she doesn't she hates politics. Like she just wants to do what she needs to do. She wants to keep the people she loves safe and that's it. She's being involved in something that she doesn't really want to, but she has no choice of it means keeping the love safe. And so seeing her make deals with God, even though she doesn't want to, and like, yeah, I don't know, she's very much entertaining, so, yeah, and I think that's all for right now, if I read some more, I might update later today, if it doesn't get too dark, or I might just update tomorrow, but anyway, how's it? So, it's the next day, and I've just done some cleaning, Verona, I also did some laundry, and yeah, and I have done some re some reading of Sunbringer, and now I'm on page 300. I am planning to do some more reading, just because I am at the end of a chapter, so I think I want my day. Uh, I just want to update now when I, when I have some energy to do so, just because I'm not feeling well. I'm doing with some like pre uh, pre period stuff, so. Yeah, my sister make is in love with me right now, so. But, um, yeah, I did do some reading yesterday, some morning, and, and we see how the pamphlets that Nala and the others have been hanging out, handing out, how that seems to have to give the people courage to fight for their city, to fight for their beliefs, like we see as they're um, putting offerings to the god of knowledge sky I believe it is on the windowsills and one of and we also see the first battle between Elo and the guards and Aaron's knights and really the the dar the darkness it can bring out and others like Elo who was in a who previously was in a war like it brings out something in him that doesn't like like it turns him into he feels it turns him into this monster, this creature and Someone he doesn't really recognize, and he has to take it also. Uh, Carvin, I think that's how you pronounce his name. He allowed his guard to take his god, my god, to take over, and by like carving with his bone into his chest, and all, but by allowing his god to take over him, he, I guess, unconsciously allowed others to be taken over by this god like they all become extremely violent and it's not until Elo like snaps them out of it that they realize what they're doing and Carvin he is punished for it so we really see like that and we see as well when someone from one side is killed how that affects everyone on that side and how upset, like, 
someone who's not a soldier, someone who didn't ask for it, was killed, and no, she's extremely upset with Elo, like, we didn't ask for this, we wanted to be, do this peace, but it's like, and Elo is basically like, peace will not have worked at all, maybe or maybe, yeah. And it's like, this entire thing is a big chess game, I mean, the players are making moves, and the chess pieces are upset that they're being treated like chess pieces, so... And with Kaysen, when she goes to the capital city of Sakri to deliver Aaron a message, she sees that a rebellion has taken over, and where there was like a thriving uh, marketplace, people are now living in tents there. And you see that the leader of this rebellion is someone from Inara's past, I'm gonna say. I'm not gonna reveal who, but someone who wants to continue to keep Inara a secret from, I guess, the, gen the general public, the rest of the nobles. And, and we learn more from the part I read of, like, who exactly Anara is and like her connection with the gods. Like, she is able to communicate with other gods, not the Skadi, and is able to really communicate with them. So, yeah, I was really interested in the motivations of this person if it's just to take out Eren, take out the king, or if they have bigger plans for Nara, like if Nara is just a pawn to them, a pawn in their own chessboard, so yeah, I'm intrigued in that also. He was like, ah, no, that's a spoiler, what I want to say. Um, yeah, I'm just curious, and also like, how, I also have to say that I like how, not like, but it's just intriguing to see like, how kind of thinking himself as a god has changed Eren, because King Aaron, he's become someone that Elo, who was his closest friend, doesn't recognize uh, at all, and it's not long since they separated. I think it's been a matter of weeks, and it's only also been a matter of weeks since Elo was betrayed by Aaron. So now yeah, that's also interesting. So the way the way war changes a person, the way that the um that the way. Um, I guess the way we want to get things or what we want to get changes us, like how motivated we are to get it, even if it means like changing who we are or losing who we are, like losing, not like, not considering our morals anymore, it seems like for some of these characters, so yeah, so far, just enjoying this definitely more than before, so yeah. Probably gonna finish this tomorrow, and when I do, right then I'll see you. So, yeah, I'll see you next. So, it's the next day, and I just finished Sunbringer by Hannah Kenner, and I really much enjoyed it. We do see like the final um, big battle, I would say, and I have to say, I did like with Skitty how he uses his will to kind of when a um, king is marching for the city, he uses his will to tell people like the king is a bad person. You, you shouldn't support it. You should like do stuff to him. And it's like instead of like white lies, he's spreading, I guess, what he believes is true. And I'm saying that because some people like they do worship the king no matter what. So that's the only he he's using his will to convince people really too that the king is a bad person. I do like that. And as well, I do like how the rebels who didn't want to resort to violence, they form a line around the archives, um, which is called the Coach, Coach, C L O C H E, to prevent the soldiers from getting in because they still think that the soldiers are there to destroy all records of the gods, to destroy. Uh, records of history, really, actually. but that's not what they're there for. They are there to kill the god Skyn, who is the god of knowledge, the city's god. And they do succeed in that, like, they do force her out and kill her right in front of everyone. And she's not the only god who dies 
in this battle because Nara she cuts up all of her hair to summon the gods and like really to give offerings to the gods and all of the gods like she like, gave an offering to most of them died and one left Le 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 kind of they gave up the fight because her son I think okay, and then who was the innkeeper who just was the one who like, allowed her to take over him. He also died. So, so yeah, she is. Gone. She 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 feels guilty about the dependency. And we also see like, finally the big battle, I guess, between Aaron and Elo. And Elo, he stabs Aaron like where his heart should be. Like Aaron has like this this opening in his armor to kind of like show that. He, basically no longer has a heart. And he thinks he like killed him, but Aaron I guess was able to create a double of himself made out of tricks and um and branches and frames and whatnot. So he's not dead but I guess yeah. And somehow he he is able to teleport himself and accidentally brings Skitty and Nara back to the capital where they are greeted by the Wabos led by the person from Nara's past and Nara she tries to kill the king because that's what she thinks should happen but Kiss and she shows her why she shouldn't like what's been going on like why Kiss and didn't go back to her sooner and they see and Kiss and also asks her for the water that An gave and Nara and when Kissin crushes that bottle she also gives some of her blood like an offering to a god and An shows everything that's really been happening, a vision of what's been happening as a city that we're telling Otho when it was reported to be burning the others thought it was Eren's job but Aaron isn't responsible for that. It seems like the god Heis is responsible for this, or her followers at least. And it seems both Aaron and Hestora, the god that's uh, in his chest, like I guess in replacement of his heart, learn they were both deceived by Heth, who it seems she returned in the epilogue, and it seems like. There's a scene where some people in a village are burning skulls of children and there's a woman dancing. So. Man, it seems like everyone, they were so busy fighting one another that they weren't noticing like what the true enemy was doing, what was really going on. Like They were just casting blame on one another without really what was really going on. So yeah, it seems now a bigger war is going to be happening. So. Yeah, I did enjoy this for, I would say, like, the last line, it just felt a bit erupt to me, like, it just felt, like, before we get to the epilogue, it's like, in our, I don't know, when I was reading this, it just felt like, the ending just felt a bit sudden, but yeah, I very much enjoyed Sunbringer, and I'm gonna give it four stars, so, yeah, and... Later today or tomorrow, I'm not sure when I will be starting my next book, which is Rewitched by Lucy Jane Wood. I just put my bookmark in if you've noticed it, like it's only on Patreon. But this is about this woman named Belladonna or Belle Blackthorn, who's, who hasn't lost her magical spark precisely, but she hasn't seen in a while. and. She keeps her witchcraft a secret and she has this like toxic boss at a bookstore she works in and she is told that on her 30th birthday she must stand in front of the coven and kind of prove to them that she is worth of it, worthy of her magic and if not she risks losing it forever and I guess it's just her feeling more worthy about her powers and feeling worthy of her magic because she's always been, I guess, someone who's blended in with, like, the normal or whatever. Like, she's kept the parts about her that are different, hidden and under wraps, so... 
that's really her coming into herself. So yeah, I'm very much intrigued, and I'm intrigued to seeing someone. Like usually with these stories, I feel like people finding themselves coming into themselves, accepting who their their differences, like accepting what makes them unique from other people. I feel like those are stories we really see amongst people like in their teenage years. So I'm very much to seeing someone who is thirty, someone who you would expect to kind of like accept everything about themselves, like accept themselves, I guess, if that makes sense. So yeah. And yeah, I think that's all for now, so I'll see you in a stuff and we just went a couple errands I did some grocery shopping and whatnot and it was very beautiful these walks and but a bit chilly <laughs> and yeah and I did do some reading of me rich and so far I'm just having fun with this honestly like it's the it's very like so far I guess quite light but we meet um our main character Belladonna who hates being called Belladonna so she goes by Bell while well, she's working at the bookstore, she's a manager of And we see, like, it, it looks like it's a, um, kind of, like, continuously, like, not continuously, like, repeated argument, I guess, with the former owner who has retired, and she wanted to sell the bookstore to Belle, and Belle doesn't really have the confidence to manage it, like, she doesn't think she will be able to succeed, that she will, that things will go wrong, and all of that, like, Spell worries that there's too much on the line, that if she does take over, she will do a bad job, and all the money she's put into it, and she doesn't have, like, the most amount of savings, it will, it will all go down the drain. And the boss, like, doesn't really have the choice, but pass down that, this bookstore to her son, who is, Apparently a businessman or whatever that means, but he has like a corporate background and whatnot. But Bell and him, like they butt heads continuously. He changes things that Bell has implemented. Like he's taken away this like coffee bar that they have because he thinks he will just turn the bookstore into a mom's club of some sort and <laughs> yeah. And as well he walks all over Bell like he tells her to meet with the bangs even though she is busy and he doesn't take her like like the fact she's busy into account like he overworks the employees like he cuts down stuff and raises the hours like so we see that and we see how the how one day one rain stormy day this very handsome stranger walks into the bookstore and he is there basically as a messenger for the coven to deliver about a letter that really is like talking about the fact she has to do her trials and the banter she has with this guy is this top notch like it's just hilarious in my opinion <laughs> like I, I just love it but it, and I also love the fact that the fact he had to show up was because her letter got lost in a post which <laughs> I can see about worrying start to worry about the fact like on her 30th birthday like she will have to face these trials. Really, she hesitates for a few days before opening it and realizing that she has to deal with these trials and that her mother wasn't allowed to tell her because it looked like she's interfering with how Belle lived her life because 
in the trials are to see if you're worthy really of being the witch of you or and if you are seen as worthy you keep your powers but if you if you're seen as like abusing your powers or neglecting your powers they're taken away from you so that is what I was worried about the fact she's kind of been under under utilizing her powers and with the fact like um oh my god where's my train of thought and the fact like she did spend a lot of her teenagers in her early 20s kind of being <laughs> worrying about like what other people thought of her and she just spent most of her oh, most of the time she had her powers of trying to blend in with the non wicca community the non wicca world so i do i think that's interesting i guess and let yeah, me see kind of bow us i stopped on page 70 and we see how bow she starts she enters the location of the of the coven and she's trying to find her way to I guess the main entrance point and she's calling this maze and she also um she hears the voices of those she loves saying the worst things they could probably say to her and she knows it's not real but in her mind she thinks it's real so yeah that's where I've stopped and so far so far, I am enjoying it. I'm just having fun with it through a couple of times, like with the fact uh, Belle is so unsure of herself. She's not fully confident in who she is and her capabilities. Like it is, I don't know, at times it feels a tad bit repetitive. Like, we did it. This girl is insecure. She's not. This woman really is insecure. She's not sure of herself, even through everyone around her, is like, you can do this, you are, but it's like, it's more of a self thing, she worries so much about, like, about what can go wrong, and I think that's all something we can really do in between, when our future's on the line, when our money's on the line, so, yeah, so far, I'm enjoying it, I'm, I enjoy the most, like, that scene with her and the stranger and her banter, like, I was cackling with that one, I also love her dynamic with her best friend, how how eccentric her best friend is. <laughs> so yeah, so far I'm just having fun with this one. So yeah, and I'm pretty much tired. So sorry if this initial review was a bit nonsensical, but yeah, I've had a long day. So yeah. I'll Today I go to the library books and I went on a walk and I had to run a couple more errands. And yeah, today was very nice, very beautiful, <laughs> and I have done some more reading of my ways. But before I get into updates, I didn't want to share the books I picked up at the library books so because I picked up I think five books. One, wait, the first one being Love in a Time of Korea, Korea by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Yeah, I guess I can show you. <laughs> and this was translated, if I can find it, by Edith Guasman. And this is about the aromatic fumes of a lover's poison lead the way into the story of an unrecorded love that survives 51 years. 
Brian told Arisa, a man with the soul of a poet and the patience of a saint has waited more than half a century for his love, Rama Dasa. Since she revoked her promise to be his wife and married one of the city's wealthiest men, that half century is filled with encounters and travels, births, deaths, and poetry. Yes, Rama Dasa and Doctor Urbano built their life together, creating a love based on shared experience. Ranto Arasa built his own life, meaning loyal to Rama Dasa in his heart, if not exactly faithful, crumbling to 622 long time The answers. But it's only when Dr. Urbano finally dies that Ranto Arasa's life finally begins. I went 100 years of solitude back in August, and I'm just intrigued to read more by my people. Next is Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer. And this is Area X has been cut off from the west of the world for decades. Nature has reclaimed the last researches of human civilization. The first expedition returned with reports of pristine returning landscape. The second expedition ended in mass suicide, the third in a hell of gunfire as its members turned on one another. The members of the 11th expedition returned the shadows of their former self and so and so forth. And we follow the 12th expedition that is... The mission is to map the terror and record all observations of their surrounding and of one another and above all avoid being content contaminated by area X itself. Uh, arrive, they arrive, expect an unexpected, and area X delivers. So, yeah, very much intrigued about that one. Next is Hunter's Hunter, which I, by Kristen Cicerelli. This one I do know a bit more about. <laughs> Not so cool as I always with the other two, but I believe this is about a witch who hops, which is like Gabe, which hunters and which hunter who is taxed to find her. Um, I've just heard very excellent things about that one. And, yeah, I don't know, at a day, time of day, when I'm kind of like losing this thing for time. Next is The Arcane by Janet Bulisa. But this is about this. 18th century apothecary struggled to realize the alchemist's dream. His name was Johann Frederick Bolger, but instead of transforming base metal into gold, he was to discover the formula for something even more exotic and elusive. A substance so precious it was once known as white gold. There is a formula for which others were prepared to lie, steal, cheat, and even kill to process it. It seemed very interesting and quite dark, I guess. And last but not least is When We Were Dragons by Kyle Barnum. And I believe this is like, and this takes place in the world where women transformed into dragons and we follow this girl whose mother transformed into a dragon, so yeah, I don't know, I'm very much intrigued about that one. But I uh, saw so the books I got today, and the park itself was very beautiful, and, and I, as I mentioned, have done some more reading of We Witched by Lucy Jane Wood, and I'm on page 128. And so far, I'm very much enjoying it, like, it's a fun time for me. Yeah. But what I got to is we see... My phone. As um, Belle is at her trial, and it's kind of not being delayed, but being put on hold constantly because she doesn't know what to expect of this trial. Like, the trial is led by these two um, mis mystical sisters or anything, not mystical, but they are very well known in the magical community for being, for kind of casting this spell or doing something that will make them live longer than expected. And these sisters seem to be like the head of the covenant. You see how these sisters are very much different. Like Murano, one sister, she's like, she sticks to the books, very, quite strict, quite serious. 
She doesn't like Bow at all. Like, I'm, like, I don't know. I'm just not impressed by Bow at all in her performance. While the other sister, I need to. Gwen, I'm so sorry, but she does. But she seems more like hearted and just like. I'm too comfortable, though. Like, she's like a nurturing figure. <laughs> I would say she's like, oh, you want tea? You want biscuits? Like, she's just very lighthearted, very sweet. She's like, oh, you want buy them as your biscuit? Then you might like. It's just, she's very sweet and very understanding of the fact um, that, like, was given her magic in a point where she was extremely young and she, well, but was still young. She's like made decisions that the other person that come in mind looked down upon and it seems like this trial it's, it seems like just not to see if like only if how you're using it like if you've done good or bad but if you're underutilizing it like oh it didn't explain it it seems like the point is like are you under underutilizing your magic and yeah we see how the the trial seems to be the coven we've collecting on nine points in Bow's life from that point she received her magic to now and with each memory I guess their opinion of her goes down and down because initially she started as this bright young thing like with her magical mother her magical grandmother and then gradually over time like that ambition in her slowly slight slowly died down and she became I guess more selfish in the way she used her magic like initially she used her magic to bring comfort to her friend who was going through a tough time and all that. But then she started using her magic for more I guess selfish purposes selfish I should say but trying to change herself to like physically to become who her friends in university were looked like and trying to change herself to like her personality to not become more brave but just to become more like, feel I guess more worthy and yeah we see like the the coven like they seem like they are mainly like people who are older I would say like who they oh my God, my mind, they, they forget that people in their teenagers people in their 20s like they are sick they are expected to behave a certain way, to look a certain way because of how society wants us to. Like, we all want to blend in, like, don't we all want to be like 21 in university? Like, so yeah, at times I just felt like the couple members were out of touch with, like, reality, I guess. But as well, Morana, like, she is also a bit out of touch. Like, she sees that Belle is only underutilizing the magic, she's not using it to her full advantage. Like, while Brian seems to be more understanding and it's like, we need to give her another chance. And yeah, that's really the verdict that given Bao a second, not a second chance, but because the sisters were bickering back and forth, the person who's there to kind of like, be like a, a peacekeeper or, There. It's like, yeah, a balancer, that's the term, like, they're supposed, they're there to keep the peace and because these sisters cannot find a balance, like, the trial, like, it's not cancelled or there's no verdict that's been reached, but it's been postponed until everyone calms down and, you know, Belle's given more of a chance to keep her magic, so... Yeah, so far I'm intrigued. Who I would have to say, this is very much different to what I when I heard a synopsis of it, I was expecting a different story. I was I thought that um, the trial would happen later in the novel, and we would see Bella. Like, she has plenty of time to prepare. I mean, really, in this book, she only has a day to prepare. Like she would just use her magic more to try and prove to herself and to the coven really that she deserves to keep it for us it just seems like right now she's not really proved anything to anyone like they all are like ready to take her powers away so yeah so that's what I was expecting but now it seems like she might have time to show that she to, to give her a chance that 
that she does have potential to give her magic, uh, give her, um, yeah, give her magic action. So yeah, let's have a fun with this. And I'm intrigued to see where this goes. So yeah, I think that's over now and with that. Since it is a Saturday, <laughs> that also means it is the end of this weekly vlog. So if you enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment below, tell me what you've been up to recently. If you want to, please subscribe to this channel. And if you want to follow me on any social media, all those links are in the down bar below. I'll see you guys next time.